Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Crime After Crime. It's May 1st. I'm John Lorden. And I am Daniel Hallen, and happy to be back. I feel like this year is flying by, just saying. Yeah, well, that's because every day has been the same. <laughs> no, I, saw, I saw a meme the other day that was like, oh my gosh, what exactly to say? It was like, everyone change your uh, short weekend pajamas for your long weekend pajamas. No, no joke. Seriously. <laughs> it was so perfect. Uh, at least one of us might be sitting here in sweatpants right now. Um, I'm actually surprised I'm not in pajamas. Usually I am. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is definitely a comfy enough t-shirt to almost be like pajamas. And I am technically wearing yoga pants. So borderline. Oh, there you go. Well, but that's, I'm just... that's, as, that's as good as it gets, though. I haven't put on jeans in months. <laughs> I know. I know. It's been a long time since I've worn some jeans. I also had a couple questions for you, Danielle. Um, okay. You went to beauty school. I sure did. Did you learn how to cut men's hair there? I did. Actually, that was my specialty. Really? I did. I loved, I actually went in thinking and being really good at updos and like editorial style things and lots of long hair. I loved it and braids. But then I remember doing a men's cut for the very first time and I don't know what it is about it. I don't know why I enjoy it so much, but um, I actually planned after doing that to, I really wanted to go and work at a barber shop. But wow. a barber's license is very different than a cosmetology license, and it actually takes here the exact same amount of time. So it didn't pan out, but I did really enjoy doing men's hair. It was my favorite, other than updos. Well, you know, I'm always looking to make sure that you can have fun. And did you know that it's only an 18 hour drive from where you live to where I live? <laughs> <laughs> Look. I'm on my way, but there's a problem because I also haven't gotten in my car in a really long time. And then I did for the first time the other day. And I kid you not, I think I forgot how to drive. <laughs> oh my goodness. Well I then don't do it. I didn't even recognize the inside of my car. I wow. just bought it at the end of December. And so I got in and I was like, wow, this is nice. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't been in it in so long. I would absolutely drive. It'd be pretty. Are you kidding me? Oh, it'd be, yeah, it'd be an awesome drive. Uh, I would love every second of it. I really need to help because my hair is getting ridiculous. Um, my, my spikes are gone. My hair is starting to fall. I'm having to use all kinds of product. It's taken me like a half hour to even get it decent. Yeah, this this is, I'm not used to this, Danielle. It I'm looks freaking out. nice though. I think it looks really nice. It took a lot of work. <laughs> 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 it took a lot of work. And I might be using beard trimmers to trim up the sides. It's, oh, yeah. no, John. I know. I know. Well, try to buy some <laughs> clippers right now. It's insane. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, yeah. The, the word is out. Clippers are gone. Well, you're doing a great job because I've seen some very scary things happening out in the world with DIY at home haircuts. So I'm very impressed. Yeah, um, I've been. It's funny because I've been thinking about that when I do get back to my hairdresser. Um, <laughs> I wonder, I want to ask her, like, what type of horror stories have you been seeing? Like, what's what's oh, the I can, worst? <laughs> I can only imagine. Good grief. <laughs> yeah. And it, oh, I can't wait to get back because I'm just going to give her a huge tip. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, these poor people that have been out of work. Um, when you do finally get to see those people that take care of you again, please. Tip them. I also know huge. a lot of people in uh, areas like that because I was a part of that community for so long. Yeah. They're having people like Venmo them what they would normally pay them a month for a haircut. Oh, that's awesome. That's yeah, what I wish I had better contact info yeah. for her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Pretty cool. I love seeing people step up. I'm all here for this. Definitely, definitely. All right, well, it's time to get to crime after crime. And to do that, we got to start with our voting results from the previous episode. Uh, Danielle, tell us about the voting results for craziest evidence. All right, you guys, I have not seen these results yet. <laughs> On Twitter, I received 65% of the votes. Nice. John received 35%. I'll take it. That's crazy. I swear it would be much closer than that. Those were yeah. some good stories. I was so proud of that episode. I am too. I am too. And I'm, I'm more than happy to concede. Uh, that was really, really good. And hey, 65-35. I'm telling no, you. No shame. No shame you, there. On YouTube, it is 66% to 33. So. Well, now, hold on. We lost a present there somewhere. So I, I think it, I should take that percent. It's, you let's should. Make it, I'll give it to you. Yeah. 66 to 34. <laughs> I'll give it to you. You can have it. <laughs> Go ahead and take it. Oh, my goodness. I needed this, you guys. But now I just have to kick butt this episode as well, because that brings season two total so far 
three for me and four for John. We're so, getting close. We're getting if, close again. If you don't mind, I'm going to take my cut back. I've missed it. It's been with you oh, for far too long. Okay. All right. Here you go. You ready? <laughs> yep. Oh, oh, there you go. Everyone pretend that that went beautiful. Yeah, wow. If you're listening it was on weird. The, if you're listening on the podcast version of this, John just passed the cup to me, and we did a really great job seamlessly doing it. Yeah, it was absolutely perfect, and you guys are missing out not watching the YouTube version <laughs> of the cup exchange. Uh, you know, at some point, maybe I'll have to release, you know, like we released a little blooper thing towards the end of last year. Yeah. Maybe I should release a compilation of all the cup exchanges. Oh, boy. We yeah. actually do pretty good on most of them. Yeah. That one was terrible. I think it'd be cool terrible. to see them all in order, though. And that's like literally all that the video is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think I think I probably feel so bad this time just because I haven't had the cup in so long. Yeah. <laughs> because you've just been killing it on all of these episodes. So No, no. I'm, I'm very happy to be handing that over and enjoy it because I'm going to take it back next month. You probably. <laughs> no, I got a good one. We'll all see. right. We're going to see. We've got two new stories for you guys. Now, we have done a little bit of a topic change for this episode, but for those of you that were looking forward to felony foodsters, it will happen. We're just going to take a little more time getting there, so stay tuned. Today, we're going for a different, to a different topic that many of you have suggested. This one we're calling Shady Siblings. Ooh. Yeah. Now, fiction has told many stories of criminal siblings from the Gruber brothers in Die Hard 1 and 3 to the twin brothers called the cousins in Breaking Bad. But can real life siblings share a love of crime? Today, we've got two stories of shady siblings, and it's up to you to tell us which siblings are the shadiest. Danielle, are you ready? I was born ready for this because if some of you guys didn't know, I actually grew up with five sisters and one brother. Whoa. There is a whole lot of us. So you could say I am absolutely no stranger to the term shady sibling. <laughs> there was lots of fighting, lots of late night snack missions, sneaky plots, me and my little sister. My poor parents. It was bad. <laughs> now, hold on. Where, where are you in the range? Are you close to the middle? Um, so it's my younger sister and then me. And then the rest are older. So Okay. Okay. And like I was after a big 10-year gap. So I came in and I just, you know, the tornado that I am. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Not that anyone is surprised. <laughs> Threw off all kinds of financial should, planning. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I just, you know, I did. And then I was crazy and I was hard to control. And I was a tomboy and wild. Always got in trouble. Always hurt. So... It was something else. And I always would drag my sister into it, my little sister. <laughs> but there are three siblings from Lacucci, Florida that take the term to an entirely new level and apparently multiple states. And yes, you heard me right, three. Okay. Well, I thought you were, you were gonna say I heard you right about Lacucci. Cause <laughs> oh, that's yes, an interesting see, town name. <laughs> every time that I wrote it down while I was doing this, I just had to giggle to myself. And yeah. every time I read it aloud to make sure everything sounded right, I giggled to myself. <laughs> Oh my goodness. But the Doherty siblings consisted of 21-year-old Ryan, 26-year-old Dylan, and 29-year-old Lee Grace. So, I mean, kind of big age gap there, but they were very, very close. They were actually three of five children. They grew up living in a small trailer with their parents in Florida on a small piece of land. Um, Dylan, who was the middle child in the three, he actually ended up being sent to live with his uncle at eight years old on a farm after his mom, and you're hearing me right when I say this, realized that having five kids in seven years probably wasn't meant for her. She had a short temper. It was a lot for her to handle. Um, and so he was kind of sent away, but they still managed to stay in really close contact. A few years later, unfortunately, their dad ended up passing away and he told Dylan to always take care of his little brother, Ryan, because you'll come to learn Ryan was kind of a wild card, but they all were. And then in 2007, more tragedy struck. Their younger sister, Erin, died on Lee Grace's birthday due to the same medical condition as their father. They had lost a lot that they loved and it ended up pretty much driving the entire family into alcohol, drugs, and reckless behavior. Their uncle also died as well, but he left behind the land to them. And I believe Dylan and Ryan both moved on the land together but that is until their aunt sold it from underneath of them what? and then completely disappeared from their life. I'm telling you. Wow. And it just keeps going because shortly after this, Dylan's girlfriend became pregnant, left him, and then got rid of the baby. So this family really did just kind of experience one hit after another. It just never stopped. But on August 1st, 2011, 
Ryan's life in particular had been turned upside down, and that's pretty much where this story starts. Through his entire childhood, as you can probably imagine, he was very, very troubled. He usually drank a very young age, started doing drugs at a very young age. He would sleep around. He just didn't make the best decisions. And by the time he was 17 years old, Dylan finally tried to help him get his life straight, since that was in fact his dad's dying wish. And for the most part, Ryan did turn things around. He got a stable job. He worked on his drinking habits, but clearly he still struggled with some of his old ways. At the age of 19, he sent an 11-year-old inappropriate text messages over the course of a week. It's even more questionable because he claims, well, she said she was 13, but... <clears throat> oh, oh, that's not good. Yeah. That's not a good an excuse. <laughs> no, that doesn't really change things very much. No. But because of this, he ended up being charged with two felonies, lewd conduct and sending a minor harmful information. Now, fast forward to 2011, two years later, and Ryan was finally facing those charges. But he swore up and down that his life was completely different. He was now dating a woman named Amber, and she was due in a few short weeks with their son. He said he was a changed man. He had held a job for five years total at this point, and he genuinely expected to only receive a few months of probation. But that is not at all what happened. Ryan showed up to court in Daytona Beach and was handed two years of house arrest, 10 years of probation, and up to 15 years in prison if he broke that probation, and wow. he had to be registered as a sex offender. And this meant that he would not be able to witness the birth of his son, live in the same house as his son. And even if an exception was filed, which can be done, it can be a little bit tricky, he would still not be able to have a normal relationship with his son. He'd never be able to take his son to the playground. He would never be able to be there if his son brought friends over, no school events, no sports, nothing. And so this hit Ryan like a ton of bricks. I, I just wanna say, I kind of like that they threw the book at him. Oh, and, yeah. You know, Big keeping time. him out of those situations probably was a bit of a smart move to keep other children safe. I know that his lawyer tried to argue and say that at the time his um, he was more so along the lines of like the mentality of a 14 or 15 year old. Yeah. But they weren't I don't think they were really able to prove it. And the judge did say that he felt sorry that he had to be lumped into this you know, larger group of older sex offenders because sure. I think he knew the situation and that it wasn't a great upbringing and there were some issues, but they still just, you know, did what they had to do. And I think yeah. that was a, a very smart decision. Yeah. But his parole officer, woo, added insult to injury. He told him that he would have to pay almost 300 a month for his house arrest monitor. That was a third of what he made in a month. Wow. Uh, he also told Ryan that 80% of his type fail and end up in prison and that he was already on his way there because his home didn't even have a mailbox where he lived with Amber. And he had to receive mail with an ID that showed he was a sex offender. And if he didn't have this, it was grounds to send him to jail. And he had to have it within 48 hours. But, you know, Ryan became hysterical. He said, you know, it's not just that I don't have a mailbox. He lived in the middle of nowhere. There wasn't even mail service to where he right. was. Right. But his parole officer man did not care and said, fine, I'll be back in 48 hours to arrest you then. Whoa. Oh, yeah. They were rough and tough, man. This is Florida. Yeah. <laughs> He'll feed them to the gators. Ryan refused to be sent to prison. He told his family it was a death sentence for him. He knew he was a sex offender. He knew everything like that. He knew it was over the second he got there. So after all they had been through and the little they really felt they had to live for, they decided to make a plan because they were all each other had and they really struggled their entire life and they were kind of over it. Dylan already lived with Ryan and Lee Grace had lived in Merritt Island in Florida with her boyfriend, but had recently come back into town and was living there for a while as well. And out of fear that the house arrest monitor was wired with an audio device, they devised a plan on a piece of paper. <laughs> they just wrote notes back and forth to each other, which I mean, I think that's that's pretty smart. That's kind of smart. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> and family to them was just everything. Uh, Ryan always said that when the Doherty's would unite, they were capable of moving mountains and splitting skulls. This was like one of those families, they were like, die hard for each other. What one went through, the others went through, and this was no different. Their plan was to head out of the country into Mexico, where the government could not tell Ryan he had to stay away from his son and where he wouldn't be killed in prison. Mm. Now, keep in mind, they probably could have figured this out <laughs> if he really sat down and thought about it, but he felt like 
it was scary. Amber was literally due, I think, in like two weeks or so. So it was like an emergency right off the get-go. And the plan was once they got down to Mexico after Amber had the baby, they would bring both of them down there to meet him as well. So the next morning, August the 2nd, they started their silent plan. They woke up at six in the morning. This was a time when Ryan would normally go to work. He continued his normal routine. But instead of packing up the car with his typical work equipment, he was a construction worker. He packed it with 10 guns, including a Beretta, a shotgun, an AK-47. He packed multiple gallons of water, tons of food from the fridge, and 2,000 rounds of ammunition. And off they went. Wow. They stopped at Dade City around 721 in the morning, and this would have looked like his typical drive to work, so there wouldn't have been any red flags going. But at this point, they decided to pull over and they cut off Ryan's ankle monitor. I so immediately, immediately an alert was sent out. Yep. Um, yeah, with the location that the monitor was compromised, but the Doherty's were long gone. They were already driving south on 301, but Ryan was flying because he... Man, they were a mess. First of all, Lee Grace had taken a handful of Xanax and was apparently out of it from the night before still. She was like half asleep. Dylan was confused as to what he has just agreed to. Ryan is realizing what he's doing. He just cut off his ankle monitor and he's basically running away from his girlfriend. He called her his wife. So he's literally flying. And Dylan kept trying to get him to slow down. He's like, you can't do this. We're going to get pulled over. You're drawing attention. But It was too late. They passed by a cop going 45 to 50 in a 30. Now, this had not been a part of their plan to get caught within an hour and a half. (laughs) This was not their their plan. And they, they did for a minute try to think of different excuses of what they could say, but they realized they wouldn't even get to excuses because, first of all, he was driving his girlfriend's car. It was not his car. Second of all, he was supposed to be on house arrest and he was not. But they wouldn't even get to that because all of the guns they just had laying around in the car. Open, open view so it wouldn't even it wouldn't even get there so they decided since there was no avoiding the problem they were going to run they topped speeds of about 90 miles an hour but they kind of figured out pretty quickly i think they were in a subaru they weren't going much faster than that so they were not going to outrun the cop so they picked up a gun and they shot at the officer because you know oh. smart decisions Seriously, this is just a a series of terrible decisions. Oh, it gets so much worse. Um, And they shot at this officer a handful of times before ducking into a parking lot to shake him off the tail. And they got lucky because they ended up giving this police officer a flat tire. I don't believe they ever hit the police officer, but it at least forced him to a stop. And they kept on booking it. As they were using back roads to navigate their way west, they passed by... Um, Zephyr Hills and Pasco County cops, like multiple cop cars flying to the scene. So they watched these people going to catch them and the cops had no idea that their perpetrators are just sneakily avoiding them. Yeah. But now the trio is faced with another problem. They're in Florida and the area they were in, they were on a peninsula. (laughs) So there's very few ways (laughs) to get off of this area. And at this point, they shot at a police officer Every way was sure to be guarded with police, but somehow within four hours and against all odds ever, the group had made it to Georgia. So this is where they started the next phase of their plan. There was no use in running when they had no money to support it. So they had their eyes on Curtis Bank in Valdosta, Georgia. They're here by 12.30 p.m. So they literally hit the floor run and they are not wasting any time. And at 12.30 p.m., the trio headed into the bank armed with a machine pistol and an assault rifle. And it was the sister had one of the guns and then one of the brothers, I believe Ryan had the other. Actually, it might have been Dylan. But they walked in, fired shots at the ceiling, telling everyone to get down and be quiet and get out of their way and saying they weren't going to hurt anyone. The other sibling, without a gun, jumped over the counter, grabbed $5,200 in cash, stuffed it into a bag, and then they all left the bank. Now, they did have masks on, so no one could really recognize them, but one of the witnesses managed to see the car that they left in. They saw the type of car, the color, and they also saw the license plate and that it was not a Georgia one. Within two days, the FBI was able to figure out that the car chase in Florida and the bank robbery in Georgia were connected. Yeah. Wow. They scanned through surveillance of the robbery, and one of the main things they noticed was that one of the shooters in the bank had their nails done and had long hair. So, obviously, one of them is a female. (laughs) Way to go, Dylan. (laughs) Ruined it for everyone. So, it really didn't take that long to put together the pieces because Ryan had been sentenced to house arrest on the first, his monitors cut off on the second, 
Authorities are already alerted to this man. Soon after this, a car chase likely connected ensued with his girlfriend's name on the registration. The same type of license plate was then seen at the bank in Georgia, and his brother Dylan and sister Lee Grace were unaccounted for. I mean, it really, it really wasn't, wasn't that difficult to kind of figure out what was going on. Yeah. So a nationwide alert was immediately sent out labeling Ryan, Dylan, and Lee Grace as armed and dangerous fugitives. And they actually were, they made this a big deal because they're saying this is family. You know, this isn't three people who are likely to kind of flake out on each other. They have a very strong bond and they are very committed to each other. So they are probably more dangerous than just your average trio that we're looking for. This ended up causing a media storm that would ultimately lead to their demise. You guys, this hit the headlines like no other. I've read some of them. I'm going to tell you one of them. This was insane. As if their history wasn't unusual enough, their risky behavior and their crazy luck was mind-blowing. And Lee Grace happened to be a stripper. And she was the picture that they released holding the gun in the bank. So she made a great headline being labeled a gun-toting stripper. I mean, she had illegal people she had danced for and stripped for, start selling her nudes everywhere. It just created this, like, it was insane. And what was the name of her hometown again? Um, she lived in Merritt Island. Oh, okay. She wasn't from Lacoochie. I don't think she, I don't think she was from Lacoochie. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to check. But that would have that would have made it even better. <laughs> um, but America was just watching the story unfold, and authorities were scrambling to figure out where on earth this trio was. But it was very hard to do because their path didn't make a single bit of sense. Because there were a lot of holes in their plan. I'll just say that they basically spent days aimlessly driving. I'm going to tell you their path. They first drove back into Florida because, you know, again, great decisions. <laughs> and then back. Can you forward. imagine if that was an accident? Oh. Where are we? We're going back into Florida. <laughs> and this one, this wouldn't be the first time they wanted to do it either. Just saying. Wow. Um, they drove back into Florida. Then they drove back north into Georgia, then to Alabama, then to Mississippi. Then from there, they went to Arkansas. And then they said, oh, let's go back to Mississippi. Then they went to Louisiana and then they went to Texas. And they did all of this, which is probably the most impressive thing, on back roads. Wow. They didn't use a highway. (laughs) Yeah. They had completely wiped their phones so they couldn't be tracked, and they were using an old-fashioned map. And they Mm. were just, that's how they were doing it. (laughs) Well, that explains it. Who knows how to use a map anymore? (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. But they were very smart about things. They took turns going into stores. They would make sure they wore sunglasses and hats when they went out. So... You know, they yeah. never never went out together. They never went back to the same place twice. So while their pattern of driving was a little bit erratic, they thought that they were doing a great job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they were very impressed with themselves. <laughs> now, meanwhile, the information authorities were receiving from the siblings' friends and coworkers, it was not very promising. They were told that there was a running joke that the only people that could kill Ryan and Dylan were Ryan and Dylan. <laughs> oh, jeez. They... When you guys, I'm telling you right now, they all, they're the quotes that they had about themselves online. It was like, I love fishing, shooting things and driving real fast. Like this, yeah. that was like that they were reckless. They pushed every boundary and were somehow always successful with it. Like some of the stuff that they did was absolutely insane. They, there was no challenge at all that they backed down from. And no matter how hard it was, no matter how life-threatening, and Ryan looked up to Dylan so much that he just kind of followed whatever Dylan did. And Dylan was always known as a ringleader, so he would create these crazy ideas and they just kind of all went for it. So authorities attempted unsuccessfully to convince them to turn themselves in by making multiple pleas on TV. They had the uh, kid's mother come even and beg for them to come turn themselves in but nothing was working they were not taking the bait and probably because the truth is at this point they had absolutely no plan anymore ryan was an emotional wreck he was so horrified and nervous that he couldn't function well he apparently had such a big issue driving through parts of the country and he just like was having this whole epiphany about like the american government and how upset he was and then the fact that he was going to be thrown into prison and then he was crying because he missed Uh, His girlfriend and the fact that he wasn't going to see his baby be born, he was just totally losing his marbles. He contemplated going back to Florida like he was ready to turn around and go back and they had to talk him out of it, saying that's probably not a good idea. But they hadn't even really thought through how to get into Mexico. 
Yeah, well, and at this point, they've raised the stakes so much. I'm sure Border Services has been notified about these people that got in a shootout with the police and then went and robbed a bank and might be headed for Mexico. I mean, I'm, I'm positive there was some notice that was already kicked out to the border. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So they were just kind of sitting ducks, basically. Yeah. So they continued aimlessly driving and they ended up in Colorado. And this actually ended up being a place that they really enjoyed. They apparently would, they went there and then they try to leave, but then they'd go back because they liked it so much. They said it was beautiful and it was a nice place. And they thought it was a great place to hide for an extended period of time. But by August 10th, it all would end. That's a pretty long time to manage to be away. Yeah, I yeah. think. And well, and they saw a lot of the country. <clears throat> they sure did. <laughs> they sure did. They sure did. Their case had gained so much publicity that at this point, majority of people knew exactly who they were, what they looked like. Everyone in the country was aware of the crimes, and everyone felt like they were living in this movie, looking for them. It was like a wild west crazy thing, and everyone was getting a thrill out of it. So on the ninth, the day before it all went down and I say that in the most dramatic way possible, <laughs> they were in Colorado Springs. They decided to stop at a local REI to get a tent because they had been sleeping in the car um, and they decided to camp out right on the side of the road with what? no attempt to hide the car. I mean, absolutely nothing. Well, they've I'm, got all their guns in the car, <laughs> so I, I, I imagine they probably didn't want to move all that stuff. So they're trying to stay close to the car and the mm -hmm. $5,000 that they robbed or whatever. Yes. They but did manage still. to spend $1,000 in the, these 10 days, though. Just saying. Oh, They wow. did. They managed to spend $1,000. <laughs> um, but that night, they remembered hearing a truck pass by one time. And then again. And then again. And they noticed each time it passed by, it slowed down a little bit more. But at this point, they were all so strung out on exhaustion and nerves and all of that that they didn't even care they just slept yeah. through it and said forget it i'm sure it's fine then the morning of the 10th they packed up stopped at a nearby gas station like they had done every single other day and realized that there was a white suv that was hanging out around them a little bit too much and they looked a little bit closer and they saw cage in the back and they looked a little bit closer and this man was staring at them <laughs> so they kept an eye on it and sure enough, the second they got on to Interstate 25, that SUV was right behind them. They yeah. knew they were caught. Despite knowing they couldn't outrun what was coming, guess what they did? <laughs> they, tried, they tried to. They reached speeds of 120 miles per hour. Speeding ahead on the highway, they noticed exactly how screwed they were. They looked behind them. And one after another, state troopers are just filling the highway behind them. It's like little fish are jumping into the stream. I mean, just one after another. And the problem wasn't only behind them. Then they look in front of them and every single exit that they pass blocked by dozens of cops. Yeah. At this point, they're freaking out. They're like, what do we do? They're telling each other they love each other. And, you know, this is all going down and don't let one of all of, or two of us die and not kill the other. I mean, it was like all sorts of words were flying in this car at this point. And eventually at an overpass, they look up and the entire thing is lined with rifles. <laughs> wow. And they are so focused on the rifles up top that they miss the spikes laying underneath. Mm. But they decided now's the time they pull out the ak-47 and they just start wildly shooting at anybody that they possibly can until they hit the spikes and were sent rolling dylan was completely thrown out of the car he said he didn't even remember it and finally when the car smashed into a guardrail and came to a stop ryan and lee grace who i guess were okay got up and took off running in opposite directions whoa now lee grace didn't make it far she was shot in the leg <laughs> She, yeah. was, she was brought down pretty quick, but Ryan somehow managed to make it all the way to a nearby restaurant before three men snuck up on him and had to tackle him to the ground. Dylan made no attempts to get up. I think he did yell quite a few things at everyone, but he had been thrown from a vehicle. There wasn't much he could do, so he was arrested right where he was laying. Wow. And they were taken to jail. Well, just to point out how lucky they are, uh, once again. Exactly. Like, how... Um, Oh, this, boy. This could have been, I thought it, this was going to go, you know, suicide by cop mm -hmm. in terms of them getting out and starting a gunfight and you've got all those guns aimed at you. But then you get the accident going into a roll. Someone gets thrown from the car, but everyone they survives. Were, yeah, and they were going 120 miles per hour. You don't no, just wow. get thrown out of a car going that fast. 
Why didn't these people go to Las Vegas? I'm they're all. I mean, they're, they're so lucky. lucky. <laughs> they're very, very lucky. My God. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But man, once they were caught, their luck ran out. Ryan ended up receiving a total of 24 charges in Colorado. Wow. Dylan received 23 and Lee Grace had 29. And each of the siblings was held on a $1.25 million bond. Oh, of course. Yeah, no, they don't want them going. Yeah, absolutely yeah. not. And again, this was in Colorado alone with more charges to come in both Georgia and Florida once they were extradited. In Georgia, they all three ended up being sentenced to 35 years and eight months for robbery. Now, I do believe that Lee Grace and Dylan's ended up being cleared for procedural errors. I don't know how they managed that one. But even so, when it was changed, it was only changed to 30, 30 years. So all it did was knock five years and eight months off of it. Right. Um, so not a huge change. And then I've also seen that in Florida, all three were charged with fleeing or eluding an attempted second degree murder of a law enforcement officer when they shot at the cop. Yep. Um, but interestingly enough, I've only seen that Ryan was convicted of that. So I didn't see that any of these charges went through with Lee Grace or Dylan. But I know that I wonder Ryan, if they identified if he was the guy that actually fired. Yeah, well, apparently, this is where it gets confusing because the articles after they're caught get so sparse and crazy because the states were like fighting over who got to do what. There was a lot of issues where deals were made, but then they weren't carried through. Right. It was an entire mess, like a complete mess. But I do know that Ryan received 40 years for attempted murder. Um, and he also was charged for grand theft auto because he took his girlfriend's car, which got him five years and then more charges. And they just so happened to be the charges that he was trying to avoid tacked on to the end of all these other charges, five more years for failing to respond to address verification as a sex offender within 48 hours. And then 15 for fleeing to elude arrest while on probation. Wow. It was bad. Dylan, I think, did come forward and claim that he was the one that shot both times. But then I've also seen that they said Lee Grace was the one who was the one that was shooting in Colorado. They're all kind of sticking up for each other. And the stories just ended up getting so mismatched that they just kind of sentenced them the best that they could. Um, I do know that Dylan and Lee Grace tried to explain away their actions to the judge, saying they were simply trying to protect and save their brother. But the judge quite literally laughed at them and was like, you were trying to save him from probation that he was already on. Like, he wasn't going to prison. His parole officer was just telling him what would happen if he didn't comply. Like, right. he was already, you were going to save him from probation. You just made it 10 times worse. You did no saving. And the judge also told them that the plan that they tried to execute only works in movies, but that this was the reality of their actions. Speaking of movies, this this sounds like a Tarantino flick or something. I mean, this I can't believe. It, it, has there been any media on this? So I know that they were going to make a movie or a documentary out of this, but I wasn't able to personally find it. I don't know if it fell through. Yeah. Um, or if it just is still in the process of being made. Um, but absolutely insane yeah yeah that is mind-blowing and um, a huge thanks quickly to gq and cnn for the amazing articles on the case gq did great on it actually like had all of their background and everything and it, it really helped me a lot with this so yeah well my hat's off to you danielle that was a heck of a story i mean and it's so crazy too because I felt so conflicted. It reminded it reminds me a lot of a lot of the stories that you've spoken about where it's like these people do horrible things but then you hear about their background and like their upbringing and you're like dang. Yeah. <laughs> like I'd probably be crazy as heck too. If that was how I was like growing up and the things I was having to deal with. Oh my goodness, but it's just so wild to me because I mean from a logical perspective I can understand completely why Ryan was so upset, but it's like how did how did it turn into just going to Mexico to escape, potentially going to prison, and so you could see your child, into shooting at a police officer, robbing a bank? You know, it just yeah. it went from one thing to another. And it would almost seem to me like they kind of realized once they really messed up, it was like, well, there's no going back now, so let's just freaking go for it. There's definitely an aspect to that, but I think the judge nailed it, that they were almost <laughs> living in a fantasy at that mm -hmm. point. Because it's mm -hmm. like, oh, look what we've done so far, and we've gotten away with this, and we've gotten away with that, and you know, just pushing it farther and farther and farther. Yeah. Um, definitely not being in very firm grasp with reality. Not at all. Yeah. I'm telling yeah. you. And oh man, and it's crazy too. Three siblings. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. And I can only imagine. I I know their mother was still alive and she was very, very upset about this. You know, she lost her husband and then they lost their one of their daughters. She had one other daughter that's alive and remains out of prison out of five of her children. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, we're going to hit some information by the end of this episode about some of the dynamics um, on the psychological level with siblings. And, you know, we've we've kind of touched on stories before, too, about families and how criminal mindsets seem to kind of pass from generation mm-hmm. to generation and can, you know, affect separate siblings like this and make them do some crazy things. But, man, wow, Danielle, that was a heck of a story. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Yeah, you might uh, want to get ready to keep that mug. Uh-oh. I don't know if I could take that one on. Woo! Yeah, oh, I, I believe in you. <laughs> that was a doozy. That was I don't a doozy. Put, I don't put anything past you, John. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see what we can do. Um, I'll be back. We'll be back together. <laughs> He's <laughs> right kicking me after. off now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I'm going to kick you off the show now because you did so good. I, I can't do this. Uh, we'll be back right after this short break. My cell phone bill is just getting out of hand. It sounds like you're still using one of the big wireless providers. Why are you paying for inflated prices and hidden fees when you could be paying just 15 bucks a month with Mint Mobile? I need to stay in touch with my family and use a service I can depend on. Big companies are better at that, right? Danielle, I'm serious. I've, I've got the phones right here. I literally tried them side by side. The connection strength, the sound quality, I even installed an internet speed app and checked them. They are exactly the same. I can't explain it, but one is just so much cheaper. Uh, Mint Mobile keeps their costs down by handling everything online, and then they just pass the savings on to you. No expensive retail locations, no waiting around for a customer service person that's just going to try to upsell (laughs) you at every turn. Just easy to understand and extremely affordable service. And every plan comes with unlimited nationwide talk and text. Okay, but what about data? I need unlimited data for streaming. Don't pay for unlimited data that you're never going to use. Mint Mobile has plans with three, eight, or 12 gigabytes of 4G LTE data. They're gonna save you hundreds of dollars a year. The average American only uses about four to five gigs monthly. That sounds good, but I also don't want my phone number to change. It's another great thing. You can bring your old phone number over to Mint Mobile to get your new wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free. Go to mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. That's mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash crime after crime. The word forensics often brings to mind white lab coats and latex gloves, but forensic detectives spend their days rushing from crime scene to crime scene with no resources to help deal with the emotional trauma that follows. Brought to you by CrimeCon, the new podcast, Shattered Souls, a forensic detective's diary, follows forensic detective veteran Karen Smith as she revisits her poignant and detailed journals to share the stories of victims you've likely never heard of, but who she can't forget, and the shattered souls left behind in their wake. CrimeCon Presents Shattered Souls debuts May 9th on your favorite podcast streaming platforms. Learn more at crimecon.com forward slash podcast. Once again, visit crimecon.com forward slash podcast and don't miss CrimeCon Presents Shattered Souls debuting on May 9th. Welcome back, everybody, and please support these amazing companies that believe in crime after crime. We really, really appreciate them. Definitely. And uh, I know we were just talking about CrimeCon. Danielle, do you realize that right now we should have been at CrimeCon? This is when I want to cue careless whisper and just like cry. <laughs> <laughs> I might join you. I'm telling you. Doo, 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 yeah. Just like bawling on the floor. <laughs> it I makes might, me I might, sad. I might. I might jump in on that. Um, hopefully we'll be there in, in late October, but yeah. it's always such, I mean, I, I think we both work hard there, but it's also such a relief to just know we're part of a community and we get to interact with all these other great podcasts and shows. Um, thankfully, I've been trying to do something special over on my channel. So if you need your kind of crime con type fix, you might want to check out True Crime Game Time 
on my channel, Lord and Arts. These special shows are live on Saturday nights while the stay in place orders continue. And we play Jackbox party games with some of your favorite hosts while raising money for Feeding America. We've already raised over, actually I can update this, over $2,000. Mm -hmm. Wow just in our first five shows. And we've had some amazing guests on, including Danielle Hallen. Woo, I had a great time. I did terrible, but it's a blast. <laughs> it's so much fun. It's so much fun. Uh, we also had Stephanie Harlow, Sarah Turney, Gray Hughes, Mike Morford, Crawl Space, and many, many more. Join us live this Saturday night at 6 p.m. Pacific and Mountain Time, 8 p.m. Central or 9 p.m. Eastern to join in on the fun and see who shows up. Audience members also get to play along with us. You can jump in on the app. Yeah, it's super, super fun. So it please is. It's a ton of fun. come check it out. Maybe donate a little money and let's help Feeding America. Mm -hmm. All right. Now's the time. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I got to breathe. Okay. All right, Danielle. I don't know. I don't know if I could do this. I'm going to try. All right, everyone. Fictional stories have featured evil twins time and time again. But usually an evil twin is counter to a heroic twin. From as far back as Dick Tracy's evil twin, Gordon, which I didn't know about until I looked into this, uh, to Michael Knight's evil twin, Garth Knight. Danielle, I don't know. Do you even know what Knight Rider is? No. Yeah, she's no. shaking her head now. <laughs> um, it, it's a TV show that was on in the 80s. And if you just want a good laugh, just look up Garth Knight and okay. you'll see David Hasselhoff with a little evil mustache and a little oh, evil boy. goatee. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Superman has an evil nemesis, Bizarro. But what if both twins were evil? The Cormier family seemed like they were off to a good start. Bill was married and his wife gave birth to twin boys. However, Christopher and William Cormier would end up getting into a lot of trouble together growing up and into their adult life. They burned down their own family's home before the age of five. <laughs> oh boy, here we go. Here we go, buckle in. That's how you know it's serious. It's a good start, That's it's bad. a good start. The, the, the twins decided to take turns playing with a lighter. Soon, Will screamed out, one of the beds is on fire, and I didn't do it. You gotta, gotta make sure your parents know, like right off the bat. Get ahead right. of it. You gotta get ahead of it. <laughs> you couldn't just say Chris did it. You know, no, I didn't do it. I don't know how me. it happened, but I didn't do it. As they got older, they would switch spots in class, messing around with their teachers, sometimes even switch spots on their girlfriends. Oh, boy. Outside of the somewhat usual twin pranks, they would also get into full-blown fist fights with their father. Their father, Bill, would seemingly never settle on a career path and had a criminal background of his own. He worked as a hotel manager, computer technician, salesman, and even opened up an escort service called La Coochie. No. <laughs> it was actually called A Touch of Class. That's a terrible name for a town. I can't stand it. it. it yeah, it is. But I kind of want a t-shirt that says I, I've been to La Coochie. Um, the twins were living with their grandmother when their mother was arrested for prostitution. Bill, her husband, wound up working undercover stings with law enforcement to try to get her record cleared. I don't think you'd be surprised to know that he and his wife eventually got divorced. Bill wound up with full custody of the boys, but this lifestyle wasn't great on the, quint on the twin stability. Uh, they lived in eight states and went to 18 different schools by the time they were only 16 years old. Oh, man, that is rough. Isn't that tough? I only went through it once and just changing from one school system into another. I had to take classes where I was like a year ahead in the new s school system and freshmen didn't take those classes. So I was like in sophomore classes all of a sudden. But can you imagine? I mean, how do you even get an education at that point with oh, all those bumps? You absolutely don't. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't at all. Yeah. And I, I think it really affects these guys because obviously, who are they leaning on? Yeah. You know, it's just, it's like the two of them versus the world. Mm -hmm. uh, with their father constantly chasing different career paths, the boys found that the only person they could rely on was each other. The twins would drop out of high school in their sophomore year. As they grew up, they continued bumping into trouble. William joined the Navy, got married, and became a father, but years later, He'd be divorced, broke, and have no custody of his child. He would eventually become a poker player, 
following in their father's footsteps in terms of financial instability. Chris was arrested in 2003 for possession of meth with intent to distribute. In 2009, the twins were busted together when found with a safe full of marijuana. They wound up living in a car for a while. There's just these constant ups and downs, but yeah. they were usually together to face them. In 2012, at the age of 31, the twins weren't doing great financially and decided they should once again shack up with their father, who was now living on disability and was also hosting his disabled sister and her two children. They all rented a one-story brick house in Winder, Georgia. Both of our stories, a little touch on Georgia here mm -hmm. today. Uh, the twins shared a queen-size bed, then they would stuff a pregnancy pillow between them. Uh, Will and Chris would keep going on gambling trips, bringing their, wing their winnings home to help keep the family afloat. It was September of 2012 when Bill heard a vehicle pulling up in the driveway and knew his twins were home from a gambling trip to Florida. As he headed out front, he saw Chris driving their Chrysler Sebring, but Will was driving a U-Haul truck. Oh, they no. Could they couldn't have won that much. The twins opened the back of the truck and Bill could see boxes of comic books and furniture. Where did all this stuff come from? And what was that terrible smell? Oh, no. Very did concerned. Did you buckle up yet, Danielle? I'm, I'm giving you an extra warning. <laughs> I'm very concerned. Over 400 miles away in Pensacola, Florida, a woman named Patricia Burke was frantically trying to get help. Her friend, Sean Dugas, was missing, and she finally called his father. She told him how she was supposed to meet Sean for lunch several days prior, and she hadn't heard from him since Hurricane Isaac blew into the Gulf Coast. She told him about how she went to his house to pick him up for lunch, and some strange man answered the door saying Sean wasn't home, even though she had confirmed lunch with Sean just 90 minutes prior to their meeting time. She told him about going back to Sean's home over a week later and seeing that it had been totally cleaned out of Sean's personal possessions, his pictures, his furniture, his comic books, mm. everything except for a bulky big screen TV, which was left behind. She told him about how she spoke to neighbors who told her that two guys came up in a U-Haul and said Sean was moving away with them. The neighbor even got the name of one of the moving men, Will. Good grief. I, I was so blown away by that, too. I mean, you have a neighbor ask you, what's your name? And you give him the real name? Or was it Chris? Was it Chris actually saying he was Will? <laughs> probably. First of all, probably. Either way, it's stupid. But I'm still just, I was totally shocked from the second he literally answered the door. And he was like, yeah, he's not here right now. <laughs> yeah. I know yeah. you know him and you're his friend and you have no clue who I am. And you know that I'm not supposed to be here. But I'm here to tell you that eh, he's gone. <laughs> Isn't that insane? Yeah, absolutely. Jeez. And then and then the neighbors checking in and what what's hey, your I'm name? Will. How yeah, are you I'm doing? Will. <laughs> you want you want my driver's license? Here, take a picture. Uh, Sean's father reported him as a missing person on September 13th. He also told police about a man named Will being at the house. The twins' father wanted to know what all this stuff was and what was that terrible smell. The boys said that they were helping their friend from Pensacola move and that they dropped him off before coming home. As for the smell, they said they were in charge of taking care of his dog for the move, but the dog died along the way and they were planning on burying the dog in the backyard. So the twins went to Home Depot, they bought concrete, they came home and they dug a hole in the backyard. Bill was worried that his neighbors were going to complain because the smell was apparently terrible. He wouldn't even go outside himself. But I mean, a U-Haul from Florida to Georgia in the heat? Yeah. E Ooh, my stomach is turning. Yeah. Um, but once they got this, they had this plastic bin. Once they buried the plastic bin and then poured a bunch of concrete over it, the smell seemed to go away. Back in Florida, Detective Hardnett was digging into the Sean Dugas case. He learned about 30-year-old Sean working for the Pensacola News Journal for five years, how Sean was pretty well known and liked in the community, his interesting appearance, dreadlocks and a large beard, and his goofy sense of humor lighting up YouTube videos featuring local community events, his love of comic books and fantasy games. Sean's cell phone wasn't working. His credit cards weren't being used. 
the detective started speaking with his friends, asking about a man named Will, and one of them mentioned Will Cormier. He then contacted U-Haul and asked them to search their records. They confirmed a man named Will Cormier rented a truck in Pensacola and it was returned to a U-Haul in Georgia. Detective Harnett got the name of their father and October 8th decided to give him a call. His approach was simple. He just wanted to know, to know if Bill had seen or heard about Sean. Bill told the detective he wasn't aware of Sean and certainly hadn't seen him. They ended the call and the detective thought he was back at square one until his phone rang. Bill had called back and Bill was in a panic. Oh, he was sitting outside his house, terrified to see his own boys. Bill had finally put it all together. There was no dog buried in the backyard. Oh, can you imagine coming to that realization? No, I Ooh. can't. Yeah, it, it had to be terrible. And then what oh, do you man. do? Yeah, exactly. I mean, do you go and try to confront your kids about it, knowing what they have done? And, you know, they already have a history of mm -hmm. beating up on their dad or their dad getting in fights with them. I mean, that could go sideways really, really quick. Yeah, if he's older and, you know, he, oh, wow. Mm -mm. There's other kids that are in the house because, yep. you know, they've got the sister that's staying there with other kids as well. Uh, Detective Harnett called Winder Police. Now, so Harnett is like, oh, my God, I got to get someone over there. Yeah. You know, because effectively we've got Bill there unprotected with this information. So he calls Winder Police. Uh, when they show up, the twins are gone. A detective walked around the property and saw the new concrete slab in the backyard, uh, the slab that had no reason for being there. It wasn't part of a patio. It wasn't part of like a barbecue area or something like that. Just a block of concrete sitting in the middle of the lawn. They called heavy equipment in and raised the block. Under it was the blue plastic container. The smell told them what they had found. Dental records would confirm the remains were Sean Dugas. Uh, cause of death, blunt force trauma to the back of the head. Oh my goodness. Police all over the state were now on the lookout for the Cormier twins. It wasn't long when an officer pulled their car over near the city limits and they were taken into custody. Having gone through a lifetime of relying on each other, would the twins stick together now facing charges of murder and concealing a death? Would investigators be able to figure out a motive for this terrible crime? The twins were split up. Uh-oh. I know this was so clever. I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm waiting to see. I'm like on the edge of my seat. Like, what are they going to do? Such a good move. So they, they have Chris held in Winder and then they send Will off to neighboring Jackson County. So they're both in separate detention mm -hmm. centers. This approach really seemed to work. Chris started revealing the details of what happened back in August. The Cormier twins had met Sean about 20 years prior. While their father was taking a try at being a car salesman in Florida, the twins and Sean were obsessed with a fantasy card game called Magic the Gathering. As they became teenagers, all three of them had collected thousands of cards. Some cards are very rare and worth many real world dollars, the most rare of which is called the Black Lotus. The three had remained friends over the years, even with the twins moving around so often. In 2012, when the twins wanted to come gamble in Pensacola, Sean offered them a place to stay. Uh, they were there for several days, and some friends of Sean's say that he was getting a little burnout on the twins being there. Chris states that on August 27th, he heard a man scream. He ran towards the sound, which led him into the garage, and there he witnessed Sean trying to run and being caught by Will, and Will striking Sean with an item to the back of his head, ending his life. Mm -hmm. The twins bought a plastic bin and put Sean into it, then took his collection of magic cards, which were valued somewhere between twenty-five and one hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. Chris claims that William started selling off the cards, including Sean's Black Lotus, which can be worth ten thousand dollars just on its own. And Chris said that after they packed everything up in the U-Haul, including the plastic bin that had been sitting in the garage for a week already, by the Ooh. way, Will then hired a lawn service and cleaning crew to come out and tidy everything up at the crime scene, which think about that from a forensic standpoint. Now you've got a bunch of other people that have been there. They're literally cleaning things up. I mean, oh you, you could get all kinds of false leads if they were looking at the forensic information from yeah. that move. 
Um, he also said Will is the one who actually buried Sean in the backyard. Effectively, Chris spelled out the whole ordeal while echoing what his brother had said so many years before when they were playing with that lighter. I didn't do it. Mm. The detective's report stated it plainly. Christopher stated that William killed his friend, Sean Dugas, for his money associated with the collection of magic cards. Christopher was charged with being an accessory to the murder and robbery and received a 15-year sentence. William was charged with first-degree murder and sentenced to life without parole. The jury deliberated for just over one hour. The judge ordered the twins be held separately and not have any contact during their incarceration. Troy Moon at the Pensacola News Journal wrote a piece about Sean in 2017. In it, he says that Sean was a friend, poker buddy, retro fashion maven, armchair intellectual, provocateur, hippie throwback, hairy peacenik, and tender-hearted soul who had compassion for those who needed it the most. The hurt, the homeless, the poor, the neglected, the marginalized, and the oppressed. In spring of 2013, a new homeless outreach program was started in his honor. It's called Sean's Outpost and is the largest provider of meals to the homeless in Escambia County, Florida. Wow. So another connection, Florida and Georgia, Florida and Georgia in both of these stories. Big thank you to Atlanta Magazine, Pensacola News Journal, CNN, TheRecord.com, Wikipedia, The Show, See No Evil on Investigation Discovery, uh, and Sean'sOutpost.com for information contributing to today's story. I find it very interesting that Chris ratted Will out. I do too. I do too. And it's one of those things where it kind of makes you wonder, is that really even the truth? Or is he just kind of the first guy to talk and, you know, he got a much lighter sentence going that way about it. I would like to think there was probably some forensic information to kind of support his version of the yeah, story. More than um, likely. They, the articles wouldn't be very clear about what the item was. Yeah. I did also see that it was more than just one blow. Um, one of the lawyers made a comment about it being something like 14 okay. strikes. Oh, my. Well, to me, yeah. yeah. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah. And there was this other aspect where um, they were actually being transferred together at one point. Like, they literally put them in the same bus to transport them from Ooh. one site to another. And uh, Will asked Chris... Are you trying to put a needle in my arm? Because he knew what he what Chris had given up already. Oh, oh man. Yeah, but but apparently, after that first initial kind of yeah. what are you doing? What do you think you're doing? All of a sudden, they just started talking like things were normal and like what they had been going through in jail. And well, that's what I was wondering because I mean, even after that, I don't know. It's so weird. I swear, twin bonds alone are just kind of like a very very interesting thing to see. Yeah. But I was wondering if there was like any animosity afterwards or if they just decided to put it in their past and just keep on moving, you know, speaking to each other, if, you know, they were able to write to each other or anything, because that's absolutely insane. Yeah, I don't think they're allowed to. I don't think they're allowed to communicate anymore. But at least for the time that they did have in the transport, yeah. it was literally like they had a weird 15 or 20 minutes and then the rest of the ride, like they stopped to get the McDonald's and it was just like they were just back to normal. <sighs> no. Yeah. So we decided um, we're not going to do an other stories segment in this episode, just for this episode. Uh, this was a little bit of a tough research mm -hmm. job, and a lot of the other stories are kind of dark. So yeah. I've put together a little list, a quick list here for um, things not to do if you're a, a shady sibling. Don't marry each other. Mm -hmm. Good um, idea. Don't marry your parents. Even better idea and don't kill any member of your family or how about anyone else's yeah the, the <laughs> stories were there was a lot of stories but they were all pretty much falling into these categories so it was I'm frightening th yeah i'm, I'm yeah. thankful that we found the stories we did <laughs> yeah me too me too very much so but that is all that's very valid advice to all of you not like i'm very concerned about any of you Doing yeah, this, but uh, just in case. <laughs> yeah, I don't think any of our listeners are going to do any of that, thankfully. Well, now you've heard it from us. Don't do that stuff. Yep. Uh, just a little more info on sibling criminality. Uh, Jeffrey Kluger at Time Magazine posted an article about the Boston Bombers, who, of course, were also siblings, and it raises some interesting points. Siblings have historically been viral vectors from one another's risky behaviors. 
Danielle, you were kind of talking about this a little bit, mm-hmm. even with leading your your younger sibling into yep. some issues. Uh, a girl whose older sister is a teen mom is six times more likely to become one herself. Alcohol consumption is twice as likely among kids with at least one sibling who already drinks. For smoking, the risk increases fourfold. Uh, In the case of criminality, the numbers are all over the map, in part because so many other X factors are involved, income, education, the presence of one parent versus two in the home. That comes into play Mm -hmm. with my story, certainly. Um, Numerous sibling studies have shown that when brothers make a habit of settling their differences with one another by coming to blows, that they are far more likely to become violent offenders as teenagers and adults. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, certainly. Uh, One University of Florida, once again, Florida keeps popping up, uh, (laughs) study of 538 college students found that the same boys steeped in brother-on-brother violence were also likelier to commit sexual abuse or battery. So a lot of information when it comes to how this is all interconnected, but I don't think it's hard to understand. We know that we influence our siblings. We're influenced by our siblings. And with oh, crime, yeah. it seems like it's no difference. And too, like I know growing up with a very, very big family, like if you've got five siblings, you know, five sisters and a brother like I did, like you're outnumbering your parents. <laughs> right. And you know, at that point, you really, you kind of rely a lot on each other. Even if your parents are there, there's, I mean, you're spending more time with your siblings. You're playing together. You're growing up together. You're not going to do half the things you would typically do, especially like middle school, high school. You know, you're going to want to do that with them. And so I can, I can completely see it. And, you know, especially if you're a younger sibling, you look up a lot to your older siblings. And so I can see how that also could come into play. You following in their footsteps subconsciously or not, which I think could actually be a huge thing. Um, but I don't yeah, know. that's a really good point because there's kind of the rules that you know your parents want you to follow. Mm-hmm. But then when you have numbers like that, yeah. there's like social rules and there's yep. like the, well, mom's not around. So now you have to run by your brother's rules or mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's really inter- interesting. And, you know, that really comes into play, too, when you look at my story, because I mean, they really gave Lee Grace a hard time because she was 29. She was the oldest of all of them. She's like, what the heck are you, you know, what are you doing? And they're like, you know, well, you know, we're all just, we're there for each other and that's about it. So we would do anything the other needs. Like their mom wasn't in the picture much. Like they literally just had each other. They learned from each other. When hard things happened, they drank together. They did drugs together. They did, you know, all of this. And then um, obviously who's Ryan going to go to? Dylan, because Dylan's his older brother. It's someone he's always looked up to and, you know, someone who's always told him what to do. And then Dylan feels a strong need to protect Ryan. So, I mean, it's so easy for siblings to get caught up in something like that and not even realize what's happening. Yeah. It's crazy to watch it unfold. Yeah, definitely. Oh, my goodness. But that brings us to it. Who is going to win this month? Audience, you guys get to vote on who had the best Shady siblings. Shady story. siblings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And you can vote for the first seven days after the episode drops at our Twitter account at Crime After Pod. Or you guys can also vote on YouTube. Just tap your screen if you're on a mobile device or hover your mouse over on a computer and a little eye will pop up in the corner. Hit that eye, cast your vote, and you are good to go. For the next episode, we're doing another one that has been often requested. We're going to take on criminal cops. Oh, it's going to be good. I know. That can go in all kinds of different directions. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious to see where we're going to land. I know. I know. I'm a little bit bit nervous, but I'm excited (laughs) to be back here next month to find out. If you guys want to see more of John and I, we each have our own YouTube channels as well as social media. You can just type in Daniel Hallen. I should pop up wherever you go. (laughs) <laughs> yep, or you can po- or you can type in Lord and Arts, and you will find me. Uh, also, we have a new way to submit ideas and a new website that comes with that. Check out www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com. You guys can find all of the links that you need at our new website, including our new Teespring, or not our new, it's not new, but our Teespring store where you can be a winner every single month with your own Crime After Crime mug. You don't have to fight it out like John and I do. You can have your own. Yeah, yeah. Why do we keep mailing that one back and forth? Uh, Crime After Crime is produced and hosted by Danielle Hallen and John Lorden. And as always, a huge thank you to our patrons. You guys get bonus Patreon segments monthly. It's a lot of fun. We talked about butts today. We did. We talked it was about weird. Butts. We, we, we did. 
it does, it's not as weird as it seems. We're coming up with new ways to greet each other now the handshakes are out. Right, <laughs> Plus, right. Plus, patrons also get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. It's a lot of fun over there. I would highly suggest it, you guys. If you enjoyed this show, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. And the best way you can help others find us is to tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. On that note, you guys, we're going to go have a good month and we will see you guys next time on Crime After Crime. Bye-bye.